Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the iSpring Solutions webinar series, where every week we talk about e-learning trends, share iSpring tips and tricks, and cover clients' cases. My name is Paulina, I'm the Community Manager at iSpring, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, where we will be talking about communication strategies for a department of one. And to cover this topic, I have invited Emily Wood, who is a Managing Director at Serenity Learning and has over 15 years of experience in training and instructional design. And she came here today to share her experience and talk for you guys. Hi, Emily. Thanks a lot for tuning in. How are you doing? Hi, Paulina. I'm doing wonderful. How are you today? I'm wonderful as well. Very excited for this session. All right, so today I wanna to talk to you about communication strategies for a department of one. And as Paulina mentioned, I've been doing this for about 15 years. I've been an instructional designer, e-learning developer, project manager, and market researcher. And I've done that all at the same time and as discrete jobs. I've also worked in nonprofit, government, and corporate environments. And a couple of years ago, I came out with a book that you can get from ATD Press called E-Learning Department of One. So if you're new to the industry and getting started with everything, I recommend checking that out. So let me learn a little bit about you. We have a couple of polls here that I'm hoping that you'll answer for me. If we could go ahead and put up that first poll. It should show up right on the screen for you. Go ahead and answer the question there and click the submit button. Oh, we, we got a um, comment from Karen. I have the book. It's excellent. Excited to hear you speak in person. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Okay, so far we have 80% responses for no. Yeah, so this is actually really common in our industry. I find that a lot of people who come into training departments are people that become really good and become the experts at what they're doing. And then they find themselves training the new employees who are doing it and moving into that role. Um, we have a term called the accidental instructional designer. So you become a training more as a, a result of your expertise and your desire to help people grow within your organization. So that is not surprising at all. Um, I definitely was in the position that I found myself training people and being really into it. And I was lucky enough that the organization where I was working at the time said, hey, you seem to like this. Do you want to get a degree in it? And they paid for it. Um, but I realized that that is not something that, that happens all that often. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next poll here. So this one should be up and running. And thank you very much, guys, for participating in the previous one. As I mentioned, 69% said that responded no to the question. They do not have formal education. And here, uh, we would like to see how long have you been developing training as a part of your job? And so please select one of the options below. Okay, actually we so far have almost everybody voted. So let's have maybe another 10 seconds for you guys to finish your votes. And I will close this poll and share the results with everybody, okay? All right, let's do this right now and share it. So you, Emily, should see the results as well. Am I correct? Yep. So here we see, I was curious how many people have found themselves as a result of COVID-19 uh, becoming these training departments as opposed to something that they've been into longer. And so we have about 50% of our group who's been doing this for quite some time. And then we have basically the other half who've been doing it for less than three years. I honestly thought there'd be more people at six months or less. So about a quarter. Um, <laughs> definitely um, communication is gonna be something that you're gonna find that across your career is always something that we can work to improve on. And I think that's moving toward a lot of the trends that we have now and building competencies around emotional intelligence and how we work with each other. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have two more polls here, so. Okay, let's, let's get going. Yep. So guys, how many people do you communicate with to develop a training? So 
if you're really completely by yourself, you're the person who writes the curriculum, has all of the expertise, you don't communicate with anybody, you have a perfect communication system. So that would be the zero. Um, and then when I mean department of one, I typically mean the number one, like there's another person that's the expert and then they're teaching me everything that they know and I create it. But it could be even farther beyond that, depending on how big your organization is and how many people you support. So if you're in an organization and they say, hey, you seem to know how to use a computer and why don't you just create all of these courses that we were supposed to do as instructor led that we can't anymore because of social distancing, go ahead and just put those online. You know, it's easy, right? <laughs> And sure, yes, I use that tongue in cheek. Um, it, if you know me, one of my things is that the the dirty word for me is just. I, I don't let anybody say just to me. Can you just make that a game? Can you just put that online? I can't just anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> Right, right. So let's close this one and share the results really quickly so that you guys can see who we have with us today attending this webinar session. All right. So again, about a quarter of us where you're doing everything end to end. So um, like maybe you're the hairstylist and you're doing videos and showing everybody everything because you already know how to do it all. And now you're putting it online and sharing it with other people. Another quarter or so are doing it where they have one person who is the subject matter expert who's teaching you everything and then you're putting it into the training. Two to five where it's either you have some people on the team with you or you have a bunch of experts and you support all of them. And then five plus it's a big team and lots of people in the organization, which is the smaller number, which is what I would have expected. Mm -hmm. All right. And then our last one here to affect how we're going to move forward with the content that we have. Yep, and according to the last one, we had a comment from Nina. I marked two to five because they help with content, but as far as technically, I am the department of one. Yep, I'm in the same place with you. You said Nina, right? Yeah. I'm in the, the same place there where I, I'm the one who's creating everything, but I've got like 10 different people who tell me, well, no, it should be like this, or this isn't quite right, or here's the imagery that we would like to do. Mm -hmm. And guys, another poll is waiting for you. And as soon as we are done with it, I will pass the mic back to Emily. So if you were supported in learning more about one aspect of your job, it would be, and here we have four options for you. Either it's instructional design, e-learning development, project management, or emotional intelligence. We're super curious to find out what you guys think. And so far we have over 50% votes for e-learning development. Mm -hmm. On the plus side, I would say that learning how to use the tools is probably the easiest one to learn. It is by far the most straightforward on being able to gain that as a skill set. Um, there are a lot of different organizations. I mean, every authoring tool offers some level of like come in and learn how to use our tool. Um, a bunch of them now are doing challenges, which I've gotten into a lot lately, um, mm -hmm. where it'll be like, you know, build an escape room based on any any tool that you're using and you can go in and create it. And then the nice thing is a lot of people who are developing it will upload the actual authoring tool file for you. So then you can reverse engineer it in, with a, in whatever program it is that you're using. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, so let's yeah. go ahead and share that out with everybody so that they can take a look at it. Let's do that. Okay. So about a quarter would like additional instructional design background knowledge. Um, that's the one I always find myself falling back on when I'm doing development. Like, am I writing objectives that are really meeting the organizational need? Am I writing at the level that's appropriate for my learners? Um, I put a lot of emphasis on that because I, I tend to find that I I feel the qualitative difference in the content that I create is based on how much effort I put in the beginning into building something that's educationally sound for my audience. E-learning development, actually using the tools, again, I probably spend the most time there because it's all about, um, sometimes I bite off bigger pieces than I can chew. Like, I feel like I should be able to do this in this tool. And then I spend a lot of time figuring out how to make the tool do what I want it to do. Um, YouTube is my friend, definitely. 
<laughs> uh, project management, again, that'll go a lot into how are you communicating? How are you sharing things? That's one of those skills that I feel like as a department of one, you really have to pick up in the sense that it's the way that helps people know where you are. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in depth here in the talk. And then emotional intelligence, this has been a new one that's been a focus um, for me personally, in terms of understanding what somebody's trying to tell me when they're not necessarily trying to tell it to me. So um, getting more of the context for the reasoning behind what I'm being asked to create or why I'm being asked to create it. All right, so that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. It's really helpful to understand who you are and why you chose to come to this talk and um, we'll be able to speak to that. So if you have questions as you go through, please feel free to put them into the questions panel and we'll answer a bunch of them at the end. Um, and then Paulina and I, if I can't answer them on the call, I will try and reach out to you afterward. If you wanna chat in and respond to things as we're going, please feel free to do so. Um, both Paulina and I can see that as we're going through. So I look forward to hearing your feedback as we go through it. So to that end, if you could change one thing about how training is developed in your organization, what would it be? Go ahead and tell me in chat. Share it out with everybody. If you could change one thing about how training is developed in your organization. More robust learning checks, input from learning institutions about the learner needs. Okay, practical training approaches. I use online videos depending on the situation I find myself in. <laughs> what to do in the training. <laughs> nice. An easy to use LMS would reduce paperwork and teacher time. Absolutely. I'm curious which one you're using uh, because I, I find that that's one of the things that I tend to have a lot of people comment on that any LMS that you have, everybody's could always be better. Better communication among the departments, absolutely. And that's a lot about what we're gonna talk about. Approval process, yes, again, that's another big one with our communication and how we choose to interact with each other. All right, so let's go ahead and um, take a look at what we've got here. So there are four different things that I wanna talk about with you today. The first one is how we're gonna enhance our communication with our stakeholders. How are we really gonna ensure that we're talking to the right people and we're telling them what we need to tell them and that what we have is what we wanna be sharing with them. Then we're gonna talk about formalizing taking on new projects. I don't know about you guys, but I find that a lot of the time for me, when I'm going in to start a new project that I will get people saying to me, hey, you know, can you just make this for me? Again, that just thing. Um, is This is the highest priority. I need you to put it above everything else that's happening. And particularly as the only person doing development, it's really hard to prioritize which are the things that really need to happen now. And is everybody bought in on what you're being told to do is the right option. So creating a formal process around that, again, it adds some overhead to your overall development, but it can make your life easier when it comes down to what's going to happen first and how are we going to make decisions about it. Then we're gonna take a talk about creating. So creating information radiators for project status. So I'll talk about what an information radiator is if you're not familiar with that, but this is basically getting into project management and how we would look at communicating. And then finally, collecting feedback from our learners. So I noticed that one of you said that it would be great to have beta testers to be built into your process. Um, absolutely, having a formal alpha, beta, gold, um, having people be able to give feedback as you're going in there. You can get into it with project management a little bit, determining on if you're doing um, agile development versus if you're doing waterfall development. But again, that's really going to be based on the kind of uh, SMEs that you're working with and the kind of content that you're working with. So let's get started here with enhancing communication with our stakeholders. Now, the first question that we're all going to ask is, how did we get here? Like, why are we a department of one? How did we end up in this situation that we have to do all of this content creation and we don't have any sort of support? And I'm willing to bet that a lot of you are going to give the same answer. And that is 
that we had this worldwide epidemic that made all of our training plans and all of our conferences and everything that we plan to do to connect with people completely unavailable. So now we have to build everything online and we have to train our learners on all of these new tools. I don't know about you, but I've probably learned 15 new tools in the last five months and I'm somebody that's worked in training for more than a decade. So it's a lot of like all of these new things have popped up and how are we gonna do all this work? I actually spent a month trying to figure out what the best online whiteboarding software was to mind map with SMEs from across the country. So they're just new things that you have to figure out that maybe hadn't come up before. Then we have, what are our roles? So who are the people involved in the project? How are they involved on the project? And what is it that they're gonna be doing that's gonna add value for us? And then finally, why are we doing what we're doing? Again, is moving these trainings online really the right decision? Is this content gonna be something that's going to have the effect that we need to have with it? And are there other ways that we could be providing this information that would better serve the needs of the audience? So there are a couple of main rules. So I saw about a quarter of you are actually the subject matter experts for your content. And I'm kind of curious how that works for you. So you would have previously been offering this training face-to-face -face, and now you're creating it in a, an online environment or your uh, content authority who now finds themselves in a situation where you want to reach a bigger audience. Um, it, it would be interesting to find out how you're working with that. I think for a lot of us, what we find is that we have somebody who has a deep body of knowledge in content and then they come to us as I'm going to call us the instructional designer, the training developer. And it's our responsibility to take that content and then put it in a way that's going to make it efficient, effective and appealing to the audience that this expert is trying to reach. One of the most useful things that I've been able to do is sit down with my subject matter expert and have a conversation with them about what our relationship is to each other. So I have a lot of content experts who will come to me and say, you know, I have written the book on electrical systems. I know everything about electrical systems and I've been teaching it for years. And I'll say, well, sure, but my background is in teaching adults and working with adults and how, how brain science comes in and helps play into effect here. So I trust them to be able to say, you know, here's how we're gonna set up an electrical system and here's how this is going to work but I'm gonna be responsible for how we share that with the audience and doing the needs assessment to figure out what people actually need. Like, are they not doing it correctly because they don't have the knowledge? Is it because they don't have the skill to actually do the task that we need? Or is it because they don't have the ability to actually complete the task where they do have the skills and the knowledge? So that would be something that I can come in and help them with. The SME is responsible for giving me the terminology that people are going to need in the field. So if there are really specific terms that they need, if there are ways that they need to, to um, be able to communicate with each other, but then I'm going to be responsible for explaining it and teaching it again to the learner. The acceptable performance level. So I need to be able to have a system where the person can go in and do all of this work. And at the end of it, you know, it's important that they do the procedure in a particular order or they complete it in the way that I need them to. And again, as the training developer, we don't want them to say to us, give me an hour training with a 20 question multiple choice test. Because I don't know about you, but I have yet to come across a point in my life where somebody says to me, true or false, the correct answer to the, or this is the, the correct answer. Like, that's just not how we, we live as humans. So as the training developer, you need to be able to have the flexibility to come in and set a performance level that's gonna be more based on the reality of the learner. Because you know, with adult learners, what we need to be able to do is have choice and have it grounded in real world and then connect it back to the knowledge that we have as individuals. The same idea with the performance objectives. So at the end of the course, this is the behavior change that I need. This is what I need to ask for somebody. And you should know I'm using course as like a general term for getting through the content, the way in which that that actually comes out in a practical level could be anything. But they would help us determine what our objectives are going to be. So you can use SMART or you can use um, a couple of the other different options to come in and say, 
you know, in order to be successful in this job, these are the things that I need you to do with this level of accuracy or fidelity at this percentage of time. Um, and then we're the ones who would come in and help them figure out how to do that. And then finally, they're the people who provide the content. And then andragogy is the, the teaching of adults. We're the people that come in and determine how the content is actually taught. So why are we doing this? We have an immediate business need. There's something that's happening and people aren't acting the way that we want them to act and we need them to change what they are doing at a material level that we need to go in and have them practice and prove and perform in a way that we can assess. With a social distancing requirement, we find that we have new ways in which we have to offer this information. So we need them to be able to do it in a way where both the trainer and the student or the learner can be safe in how we're doing it. And then finally, I, I'm sure that many of you are in the situation where there's no budget to create what we need you to create and there's no time. It all has to be done immediately and we all need it the way that we, we, don't, we all need it right now and we all need it as free or as cheaply as possible. So you'll get pushback for doing things like a needs assessment or multiple rounds of revisions on, you know, is this um, meeting the need of the organization? So let's talk about how we can make this work better for us. Um, I have something that I have called a learning contract. So what we have done is we make it where um, when somebody wants to create a new training, they don't come in and say, I need an hour training that's you know, 50 multiple choice questions, which in reality, they still say that. And then I come back to them and say, you know, there are a couple of things that we need to discuss to figure out what to do. And I have sort of like a check sheet. And in that check sheet, there are a couple of, or there are six things that basically I ask them for. And the first thing is, what is the behavior change? Because if it's not behavior change, then we probably don't want to be doing training as the answer to what we want to have. So if it's a knowledge aspect, like, um, you know, uh, what's the boiling temperature of propane? Like, I don't need to train you on that. I can just tell you it's a piece of knowledge. You can get it. It is what it is. Um, if it's something that has an implication, like I need you to wear gloves when you do this particular activity because of safety implications as a result of you not doing that, then that would be training. So first off, determining what we're actually doing is a training need. Second off, we talk about the target audience. So who is it that's going to be taking this course? What are the needs of that audience? What languages do we need to offer it in? Particularly now with social distancing, are they doing it at home? Are they doing it on personal devices? Um, I, For those of you who are doing e-learning development right now, I can't tell you how, uh, knowledgeable I have become in the last four months on the plethora of devices that individuals have because before you could assume well this person's using their work computer and they're at the office and there's some sort of IT department I get people now that are sitting in their backyard on a cell phone trying to take multi-hour courses that were geared for a completely different learning situation and how we're going to deal with that so really um reassessing who our learners are and what their needs are. The type of need that they have. So again, is it the knowledge? Is it the skill? Is it the ability? What is it that's causing them to behave the way that they are now? And how do we want to get them to move to this other way? Now, with communication in particular, there's something called RACI, which is responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. If you only take one thing away from today, the best thing that I think you can do for yourself is at every project you take on, you take a sheet of paper and across the sheet of paper, you write who is responsible for this, who is accountable for this, who is consulted on this, and who is informed on this. Because I can't tell you the number of times that I get to, we're going to be um, 
launching this new training. It's coming out on Friday and I'll get an email from somebody, usually like a vice president that says, hey, I wasn't consulted on this and I didn't give permission for this information to be put out the way that it's being put out. And so I'm gonna put a hold on your training because now you have to make a particular change because that's what I need. And depending on the, the letters that that person has in their job title, that can really stop up your training development. So responsible, who are the people who are going to be giving you the information and helping you keep on your timeline? In a lot of cases, you're gonna be the responsible party for most of the stuff that you're developing. Accountable are the people that are working with you. So like if you have graphic designers or voice talent or the people that are coming in and you can hold them to a standard. So you, I need this from you, we need to do it together. Again, you might find yourself being the person that's in this. For consulted, this is where you get in all of the um, executive suite in your organization. So the, the people who are gonna be, um, the, the person who asked for it, the person who's the boss of the person that asked for it, the person that represents the learners. Um, if you have a union, it could be something like that. The people who will be connected to the people taking the training and how it's going to affect them. Then we have informed. And informed is, that's usually that email that I send out on the Monday before the Friday training launch that says, okay, we have a training that's coming out. You need to be aware of it before it gets to the learners. And having this set up at the beginning when you're going through and figuring out what the training need is and how you wanna move forward with it will serve you very well in ensuring that everybody is in at the right steps of your development and mitigate the probability that you have somebody who at the end stops up your process or finds a huge gap in the content or anything else that could be an issue. Now, SMEs are wonderful people. They want to share their knowledge. And in most cases, the SMEs that I have will have these wonderful ideas and they'll want to share and they'll be out training or researching or doing whatever they do as their day job. And while you can make the case to them that uh, sharing their content as e-learning or as online training will be to their benefit, it's sometimes hard to get them to invest the time with you now. And so I've sat a few of them down who have been a little bit more difficult to get my hands on to get them to answer the questions that I need and pointed out, okay, so if you go and teach an eight hour class today, you have what, 30 people in your class, but then you have to spend eight hours every day in order to do this over and over again to keep scaling up this class that you're doing. Whereas if you and I could sit down and you give me, let's say a week, so I'm going to, you're going to lose the 150 people that you would have had. No, that's not how that math works. 30, yeah, 150 people that you would have been able to train this week um, because you're going to be spending that week with me instead. But now you're going to be training people while you're sleeping and you're going to be accessing people in geographies that you never would have been able to go to before. In order to be able to do that, I need them to give me a service level agreement. So you might have heard of this, it's called an SLA. And it's where you say, if you do this within a certain amount of time, or I need you to do this within a certain amount of time. And if you don't, then I have the ability to go do something else. You're basically broken contract with me. So if you won't make the time for me to be able to do the work and you won't respond to me within the timeline I need it, then I'm gonna move on to another project. And in order to have that have some teeth, I literally have them sign it because I want them to know that they have made a commitment with me. I mean, I literally call it a learning contract where they come in and say, this is what we're going to do. Now, planning all of this out front, you basically, it's the equivalent of a project charter if you were doing something in formal project management with Waterfall, where now you've set up exactly what the issue is, who it is that you need to access, how you're going to present it in the end. So is it gonna be um, you know, mobile? Is it gonna be um, for a computer? Is it gonna be an app? Whatever it is. You have all the people who are responsible at the different levels for providing content. You have a timeline that explains how different reviews have to happen and who is involved in them. 
And then in the end, you have a signature, like you have people who have agreed to this. So at the beginning, everybody is now set on that same goal, moving in that same direction in order to have you be successful in creating this training. Now, from there, you need to be able to communicate with your team. And one of the easiest things to do right at the beginning is ask for view rights to your teammates' calendars. Now that we don't have the ability to catch up with somebody at the water cooler or just bump into them as part of our day, you need to go out of your way kind of to make that time with somebody. So you can do that by asking for rights to their calendars. You might be able to even get in on some of the other meetings that they're having if they're are gonna be giving that training to somebody or doing a webinar, attending it, getting the information out of it and then sending questions so that you can leverage the time that they're already spending. And then of course, for setting time for you to meet one-on-one -on -one with them. You can talk to them about their availability. So if you have somebody that is unavailable for large swaths of time, it might not make sense for you to do an agile kind of feedback loop with them. You, If you can't access them and they can't give you lots of feedback, you might need to do all of your needs assessment in one big batch right up front. And then they're not going to see it again until you get to this alpha level where you're ready to, to have people start testing it and playing with it. So you can talk to them about, you know, what kind of time can you give me if it's the same amount of time. If we pick that you're going to give me 150 hours, do you want to give me 100 hours up front and then 50 hours at review? Or do you want to say we're going to do 20 hours a week and we're going to do it over the next seven weeks and that way we can do something that's a little bit more um, agile and you'll be able to see different pieces of it as we're going. Um, I am a big proponent of there is no right form of project management. So your project management should be flexible based on the people that you're working with and the people that um, uh, the people that you're working with and then the content that you're working with. So if you're coming out with a new curriculum, for example, where you're going to teach something end to end, it may not make sense for you to offer little pieces of that at once, because if somebody doesn't get it from start to finish, they can't actually do whatever it is that you're teaching. So you could develop it agilely and then hold it until everything is done and then release it all at once, or you could develop pieces of it as you go, if that's appropriate for the content that you're working on. So like every Monday, we're going to do a release. And then finally, talking about preferred communication styles, and this gets a little bit into the emotional intelligence. Um, we've done a lot of psychograph or psychometric testing with our people in our organization to find out what they like and how they want to be able to um, connect with each other. So I was telling Paulina when we were setting up for this that I, I will never pick up the phone to call somebody. Like I passionately hate speaking on the telephone. And so for me, um, all of this has been really interesting because my preferred style is always gonna be over email. I like to write things out and think through what it is that I'm gonna say. And then my second choice would be to do it as a video chat where I can see the other person and sort of get the context clues for how they work. Um, but phone, I just feel so disconnected from the other person. I just would rather not have the conversation than have it at all. So knowing that about the person that you're working with, as the instructional designer, as the training developer, I find that you need to be more able to meet with the other person. So if you go to your SME and they say, you know what, I really just want to talk on the phone, I might come back and say, hey, it would help me just because of the way that we work through the content. Could we do it as a video chat and then we can do it that way together? Or if they say, hey, I want to do it over email, then I would probably be like, yeah, that's great. And then we both are on the same page. But setting up that expectation at the beginning, talking through it with them. Again, a lot of the issues that you can find later in projects, the more you can set that up and make it something that you establish at the beginning, the more smoothly you'll find the whole project going. Also, if you don't implement them now, consider implementing retrospectives. So if you're in the middle of a project now and you get to the end of it and you think, wow, that was the most horrible experience of my whole life. I wish we had done all of these things differently. I would recommend that you set up a meeting with anyone that you're working with or even taking some time for yourself and figuring out what it was that went poorly. Like why, why did these things not go the way I wanted them to go? Or 
what did I do that really did work well this time? What did I change from a previous project? And I really want to stick with that. And then you keep that as sort of like a, uh, for me, I have a whiteboard hanging over my desk here at my office. And on the whiteboard, I have little notes to myself that say like, hey, have you checked in with this person this week? Different things that can um, provide you with cues to do the things that you want to do. Um, I've also been doing a lot of work with designing for increasing accessibility for my audience. And I found a series of um, posters that I've hung around my office that talk about different kinds of disabilities and how people are affected in the online training that you're developing and why you might consider changing the way that you do things. And so that's opened me up to um, really getting into the tools that I'm using to develop to figure out if there are better ways that I can do it. So I like to come from instructional design first and then into the tools, but sometimes I'll have something that's like, build an activity here that has this goal and I won't necessarily know exactly what I what it is that I want to do, but I like to spend some time um, researching what other people are doing and finding the best practice. Or I, I post pretty heavily on LinkedIn when I have questions. I'll just ask out on LinkedIn, hey, this is what I want to do. This is kind of where I want to go. Has anybody done something like this? And how would you recommend working with it? And I find that I get a lot of really useful responses from that. All right, so now information radiators. One of the things that I find as a huge time suck is having people come and say, where are you with my project? What are you doing? What is the status? And so I have moved to completely cloud-based development. So I have all of my projects available on the cloud if my SMEs or my boss or the project sponsor want to come in and see where I am on any different project, they can log in and see it. Um, I do a lot of my, um, because some of the stuff that I do is proprietary um, and I can't like share it with other audiences. Sometimes I use SharePoint, sometimes I use OneDrive, sort of depends on what my individual client is doing but they can go in and see everything and comment on it all online. And then I do the same thing with project management software. And I have a deal that I update them every Friday and it'll tell you if it's ahead of schedule, on schedule, behind schedule. And then if I'm being held, because I like to make other people who are involved in my projects aware if I've been stopped because we're not meeting a service level agreement or something has happened with the development or if I'm sick, you know, I, the, all kinds of things. Uh, and to that end, um, I hope you guys are taking some time for yourself. I have found that um, with everything going on that we all have tons of work and we are very, very popular people. Um, so schedule some time for yourself, go on a walk, walk your dog, uh, eat a nice dinner, whatever it is that you need that takes you away from your computer a little bit to to do some things for you. Um, sorry, that was kind of an aside. <laughs> uh, information radiators, the idea here is that that information is accessible to everybody. So like a radiator, it heats a room without anybody having to go over and like touch it. So anybody can go in, see exactly where something is, and they don't have to ask me. And of course, there are certain people that are always going to ask, and you can do what you can to try and change them from that. But um, making it as available and as accessible as possible for them to be able to come in and really get that information for themselves and figure out what it is that they want to know about the project as they're going on with it. Um, so again, minimize the need for them to ask and then work as transparently as you possibly can so everybody knows the status as you're going through your project. Now, collecting feedback. So in a perfect world, you would, in your development, have your SME or the person who's um, giving you your content working with you continuously. And as you develop your project, you have different iterations of it and it gets better and better. And then you have a version that's ready to go out to your audience. And in, if you can, 
you have the alpha release, which is the one that your SME and your sponsor and the different people in your organization, they come in and they take your course and then they give you feedback. And usually this is where you get big chunks of feedback, like this activity didn't work the way I thought it would, or it didn't work on my phone or whatever it is that you would want to, to do to be able to use that. Um, then you have your beta release. And with your beta release, you ideally test it with a percentage of your audience. So the actual learners who will be taking it so you can find usability errors. Um, one of the best things that I've ever had the opportunity to do was I booked like a three hour window with a bunch of learners and then set them up in a classroom where it was like a bullpen style, except they faced the walls and I stood in the middle of the room and I could like walk around behind them while they were taking the course and see where different people were getting stuck and figure out why things weren't working the way that I thought they would. So then I could make the changes for then our final gold release, which is the one that goes out to your full audience. Now, those are the changes that you're gonna do in terms of collecting feedback and making the course the best it can be before it actually goes out. Once it's gone out and you have this gold version and it's released to your audience, you have a couple of different ways that you can collect feedback. Hopefully you're familiar with the Kirkpatrick levels where you have the one through five, depending on how effective um, your training has been at meeting its goals. Um, I find a lot of people are in the one and two level. And honestly, if you're able to get the one and two level right now, I think that's a good thing to aim for. So the level one is, you know, how much did you like this? Did it meet your needs? It's a lot of like the smile sheet kind of thing. Are you happy with everything that we use or the, everything that happened in this training? The second level is, did you actually gain some knowledge out of what it is that you're doing? So this is where you typically find the multiple choice test. Did you reach that knowledge level? Were you able to, um, you know, take something away from this course that you're doing. The level three level, which is the one that I think we should all aspire to or get to, is are we seeing that change back on the job? So does the supervisor look at the employee in 30 days and say, hey, you know, Emily is doing a really good job now of, you know, uh, changing this bolt the way that I wanted her to, or I found the the performance reviews that Emily gave last year that she wasn't giving really good objectives for her employees for the next year. But when I look at the performance reviews that she wrote this year for her staff, now I can see that the objectives and goals that she set up for the staff really are something that meet our business needs and will be to the benefit of the employee. So I'm really happy with the way that she's made that change. So that demonstrated change, that behavior that we want to see. So have are they doing it and are they doing it differently? Now, if they're not, then you get into reteaching and um, how you can affect that change in other ways. Uh, if at all possible, you would ideally have some sort of spaced learning. So you would have, like if we were talking about this course, for example, we're talking about improving communication and how are we communicating with each other. So you would have the initial training session where you would talk about how are the ways that we're communicating with each other and how can we make it more effective with the team? And then next week we would have a conversation about, okay, what have you changed in your communication to make it more effective for, um, for your staff since we had this conversation? And it would be a series of checkpoints that you would do basically over the next three months to solidify that change and solidify the behavior that we want that person to have and uh, move it into their long-term memory. And ultimately, if it's a, a kinesthetic, a, a actual tangible skill, their muscle memory so that they're just doing it naturally the way that we want them to do it. Um, it'll be interesting if you decided to do a needs assessment right now of how effective the training that you have is the more stressed out a person gets, the more likely they are to go back to what they were taught as a child. So if as a child you were brought up to do something in a really specific way, and as an adult, you know, you've moved to being more whatever it is, whatever the behavior changes that we're trying to do with our organization, you might be seeing slides back into behavior that was pre-training because of the increased stress level that your staff is feeling. And then ways that you can work on that would be both 
mitigating the stress so that they're able to um, perform at a cognitively higher level, and then continue to reinforce in a positive way what the behavior change is that you want and how you would go about doing it. Now, once you've collected that feedback, you would then start the process over again of completing a needs assessment and starting a new um, learning contract with your organization to do the next level. So either are we going to update the content at the existing level, or are we going to continue to broaden or tighten the skill in this particular area so as our next training comes out that we have more information about that. And from there, what questions do you have? I noticed Karen was talking about Asana. That's actually the tool that the organization I'm at right now uses too. And uh, they have some features in there that our, uh, our team is really into in terms of like they can record your conversations now and then make tasks based on conversations. And it's a little big brother for me. I mean, I like the idea of having it, but I also like to think that I'm a little creative in the work that I do. And I don't necessarily want a task for every like brainstorming session that I have with somebody. I like to take some time to sort of gel on what it is that I'm thinking before I move forward. Thank you so much, Emily, for this presentation. And hopefully now you guys don't feel alone, even though you are a department of one and um, have some ideas that you can bring back to your workplace. And right now we do have about 10 minutes for your questions. And uh, let's start with the first question that I wanted to address to you. Um, it's from Sandy and um, she's asking, what is the best whiteboard? if you know by any chance. <laughs> All right, Sandy. So I, uh, I posted this one out on LinkedIn and I got nine different choices that people recommended. Um, the highest two that came in were um, Mural and Miro, M-U-R-E-L and M-I-R-O. I ended up going with a different tool for cost reasons. Um, and the one that we chose to use is Coggle. And so I, I'm actually just implementing it starting, I think I'm buying the licenses today. So I can't tell you super definitively how well it works, um, but I'm excited to, to get started with it and see if I'm able to do our curriculum development with it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And uh, another question is from Kieran. How do you communicate with customers or clients to enhance or connect them with company? Um, so when I'm developing a training, it depends if I'm in-house or out of house. If I'm hired in as a consultant from my company to go in and do work, typically I only speak with the people who work at the company and they give me the information about the customer. So the end learner, I don't talk to the end learner directly about what it is that they need um, for their training. So the company will have done some sort of research or they'll have an idea about what it is that they want the, the customers to do. And then from there, we'll develop the training together and I'll create it for them. If I'm working in-house with an organization, then I like to go directly to the, the end learner. And there are different, there are a series of different things that I can do for a needs assessment. Um, usually I do a bunch of interviews where I ask them kind of like, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, and I'm usually set up with the employees that are considered the highest performers in whatever the behavior changes that we want to do. Um, if they let me, I'll follow them around. So I just sort of like pretend like I'm an intern and figure out what it is that they're doing and then ask questions all day long, sort of like, why are you doing this? And how does this make you feel? And all the different things. And then I take that back and write up a report about what my recommendation is for the, the training and then present that. And then we write the learning contract from there. So I've done it both ways. Thank you very much. And uh, now Karen is asking, can you speak a little bit more about information radiators? How do you get people to use them when they are not used to it or comfortable? Yeah, so uh, the way that I started with it, again, the, the first time that I did this, I did it as a, uh, like I was physically co-located with the people I was doing it with. And um, I did them all as a digital thing. We were using a program called Jira. It's a, another project management software. 
And I found that the team wasn't willing at all to log into the software to look at it. Like when I sent them tasks, they'd be assigned them and they'd get them an email and they would do the tasks, but they would never go and see like, what's this other member of my team doing? So I ended up physically replicating it on post-it notes and then gluing them to a wall in one of our conference rooms. And when we had our sprint retrospectives every two weeks where we would come in and talk about the work that was done, we would actually physically remove the post-its from, like I'd had a team member physically remove the post-its from the wall while I would do all of the work in the, uh, in the software so that they were perfectly replicated. And after about four months, they kind of understood why I was doing what I was doing. And I ended up convincing our supervisor to buy us a television set. And so we hung a TV over where the team was that had the JIRA board up there. So you could actually see as people were completing the tasks in their email, how the different things were moving around. And for me, I was doing that just for the benefit of the team and I didn't think much of it. And then one day our CEO came in and was doing a conference in the conference room in our area, which wasn't very typical. And uh, after that, she started logging in every week to see where we were. So it was kind of neat in the way that uh, it went out to the team. Now, if you're building this in a completely remote environment, I think it would be a matter of sort of incentivizing people going in and looking at it. So uh, I think it was Karen mentioned that she uses Asana also. Every time you complete a task in there, a little unicorn flies across your screen on a rainbow. Um, so I, I guess that's their way of sort of making you want to go in and look and see where your different projects are. Um, for the most part, making it as accessible and easy as possible is what's gonna help you. So if you can make it where people set it as their like uh, login screen when they go into a web browser. So every time they log into a new web browser window, it comes up with a project status, things like that um, can help. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that uh, in-depth answer to this question. And um, there were a couple of questions about instructional designers. Um, so can you recommend any professional organizations for instructional designers? And as a newbie ID, what can I do in my first time projects? Okay. Um, so organizations for instructional designers, I mean, the Association for Talent Development is the big one that a lot of people um, are members of. You can also do the International Society of Performance Improvement if you're more along those lines or the um, Organizational Development Management Network. They're all kind of related. I mean, the one specifically that's training is ATD. Um, if you're doing e-learning, there's the e-learning guild and e-learning industry. Both of those have really useful um, tools. For somebody who's starting out on their first project, um, particularly with everything that's happening with COVID, I've seen apprenticeships and mentorships become a big thing recently. Um, I'm working on a project right now with like I'm volunteering with a, an organization, a nonprofit, and they have paired everybody up into an apprenticeship mentor kind of situation. So like I mentor somebody on, I, in this particular case, the person I got wanted to be mentored on technical skills with a development tool. And then I picked somebody in the organization who's mentoring me on um, the behavior change aspect. Cause what we're working on in this particular case, I don't have as much experience with cause I don't do a lot of soft skills training. And so it's this nice way of you give back and you get kind of thing. So if you can find people that are doing what you want to do or um, have something along those lines, I would recommend uh, reaching out to them. Honestly, networking with people, finding people who share interests with you is probably the best way to, mm -hmm. to get involved in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that recommendation. So, Cindy. <laughs> Emily referred to posters that she has in her office to remind her about different disabilities that affect adult learners. Would you please let me know more detail about these posters? Yeah, so um, if you want the highest level of accessibility um, in terms of development, the Canadian government makes the ones that are um, the most inclusive that I've seen, but the ones that I hung up 
I'm going to find the link. Hold on, it'll take me just a second. We were doing a lot of trainings where we were inducing stress. Mm -hmm. So it was like um, there would count down timers on the courses and um, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so we found that people weren't doing very well in the course, even though they were able to do it. And so I looked into it and I guess it's people who have anxiety, as soon as you put a countdown timer on a course, whether or not the time is like reasonable. So the, the time that we gave them was way more than the amount of time that it should have taken them to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and they still weren't doing well. And so. So they were feeling under pressure, sort of. Yeah. And so we ended up just getting rid of it full board because we found that it wasn't serving our purposes. Okay, sorry, that took me forever to find. Here it is. So this is Cindy, one of these, right? Okay, so here you go. That is the link to the posters that I have hung up on my office. Yeah, and Danielle mentions in here, I don't know if you guys can see each other's questions. She mentions the place that I am uh, doing the volunteering. If you're interested in it, it's uh, designed by humanity. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So let's see if we have some other questions that we can cover uh, during the last the the left time that we have. Um, so uh, I saw a few people asked if we're sharing the PowerPoint. I'm happy to send it to you if that's mm -hmm. something we can do. Okay, perfect. Awesome. There was another uh, question, if you could share that contract or, I don't know. Yeah, the contract template is honestly, template. Yeah. can you guys still see my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it, it's pretty much this in a Word document. I mean, I can send it to you, but it, it really starts off with all of these different things. Um, mm -hmm. And then the section that I started with at the beginning that talks about what's a subject matter expert versus an instructional designer. I have that as like a whole like hour training that I give um, when people come on and it comes with a series of worksheets that talk about like, tell me three stories. Tell me one where the person's doing what they're doing now. Tell me one about the worst thing that's ever happened with the person doing that they're doing now. And then tell me a story about somebody doing what you want them to do next. Like what's the change that we're going for? Um, and I found that that is very useful in, uh, oops, sorry, I can't draw on my own screen. That's very useful in uh, helping people understand what a behavior change is. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend Action Mapping by Kathy Moore for helping you um, build activities that reinforce behavior change. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that suggestion. And uh, let's cover the last question for today from Sandy. What methods of delivery would you use to just transmit information, knowledge that isn't training? Oh, okay. So um, I've done podcasts in the past where it's something that they can just listen to while they're doing something else. Um, obviously, uh, like job aids, like pictures that we hang on the wall, like over the sink, how to wash your hands. I've done a couple where um, when people wear lanyards, like in a retail environment, where we've made little books that have information that they need inside the book so they can flip their name tag down and then see like a cheat sheet kind of thing about what it is that we want them to do like you know don't forget to upsell do you want fries with that like that kind of thing um and no i've never done one where it's a place where you do you want fries with that but um that kind of idea mm -hmm. um so uh those kinds of things mainly thank you and megan um is asking how do we sign up for the training you emily is talking about the SME ID one? Uh, well, that one I give to people that like I work with. So like if you were doing a project with me on, and you were my SME, I would give you the training. <laughs> gotcha. um, yeah, no, that one is, is more like uh, when I go into a new company and I have to work with an instructional designer, or sorry, when I have to work with a new subject matter expert, it's sort of my way of teaching them who I am. So. I, I think it's the kind of thing that you would customize for yourself as you have a new instructional designer where you would get into what are your roles, what are their roles, and you can talk specifically to the the actual task that you're working on. So here I put it very generically, um, like this is what my, I expect from you and this is what you can expect from me. 
if I were doing it with an instructional or a subject matter expert I was working with, I would probably get into like the, I need you to explain to me an electrical system and then I'm going to give you the way that we're gonna teach that. And then I need you to teach me all the words about an electrical system and then I'm gonna come up with how we're gonna teach that. So I, I, I customize it as like a one-off kind of thing. Awesome, thanks a lot. So before we wrap up this webinar, Emily, could you please share with our attendees what's the best way to reach out to you in case of any questions? Absolutely. So I'm um, on LinkedIn. There are actually a bunch of Emily Woods. So the <laughs> one that's me is the one that was me, the picture that was at the beginning um, of me in a blue dress with my hair all crazy. Um, and then the picture of my book is my background image, but it's uh, Emily Wood, or you can reach me at emily.wood at gmail.com. Perfect. Or at okay. my company, if you wanted to hire my company, you can always go to Serenity Learning too. <laughs> yeah. So I shared your email address in the chat with everybody. So if you guys would like to speak with Emily on about any project related questions, please go ahead and reach out to her. And at this point, I think we are ready to wrap up this wonderful, uh, insightful session. Um, I would like to thank you, Emily, for coming today and for sharing your expertise with our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And thanks to you guys for being so active, for sending in your questions. And I assume I will see you at the next webinar. Don't forget to take the survey to let us know how you like this session. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. And bye, Emily. Bye.